Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're having a lovely day. So a comment that I get on this channel every single day is, you know, you've talked about all these companies that are against right to repair, against tech freedom, against you owning what you actually bought and paid for. Why don't you give us an example of something good? Well, I mean, where? Like where? Like where? Um, but today is a very rare opportunity we get to. Thank you very much for coming by. Uh, hey, thanks for having me in. Eh? Lovely folks at Edison Motors. They are creating a company that does electric trucks and electric, also electric truck uh, refits. So you, you'll take old internal combustion engine trucks and retrofit them with uh, motor kits so That's they can right. be electric. And you try to essentially do the opposite of what most modern companies do, which is fear monger you out of working on your stuff, which I think is really cool. Well, exactly. I think you should have a right to work on your stuff. Like... When I started at Edison is I started my partner, Eric, there, and uh, we bought a truck. When we sent it to work, it was a 1969 Kenworth. We bought this truck for 4000 bucks in a farmer's field. And every nut and bolt on that truck I could fix, I can service, I can repair. That truck has been in our fleet for seven years, out working. And, you know, we bought that truck, started, we were broke. It was affordable. And then we bought another truck. Then we bought another new truck. And all of a sudden, we realized on the new truck, you couldn't fix anything, anytime... We owned that truck for six months and it spent three months in the shop with this computer code, this computer code. And anytime it would go down, you would have to bring it back into the dealership and they would have to put their computer onto it and they would erase the code and the truck would go back out. And okay. but, I'm not a car repair person by any means. So I'm going to ask a bunch of stupid questions. I hopefully you'll be patient with me. When you say a lot of the modern ones are not fixable and you say uh, a lot of people have this idea in their head that like the only anti repair brand when it comes to motor vehicles is Tesla. And there are so many reasons to take to just smack them in the nuts with a baseball bat for all the things that they do. <laughs> and I do that on this channel on a regular basis. But what a lot of people I don't think I don't understand is that this is something that virtually every company is going into. Like one advertisement that I, I just showed you when you got here that you had you said you hadn't heard of was this uh, ad for question one that happened in Massachusetts three years ago, where they were convincing you that you were going to get raped and stalked in a parking lot. If question one. If question one passes in Massachusetts, anyone can access your personal data. Story and like they've got all the scary fucking lights in the background and they have the like, you know, somebody following her with the shaky camera. Wait, why does my personal vehicle need to store? Why does my vehicle need to store my personal data? See, None of my trucks need to store my information yeah, about me. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the things like everybody, like the most top upvoted comment in all the videos where I go over this is, OK, like forget about the mechanic. Why does my vehicle store my shit? Yeah, but, but like uh, the, these fear mongering campaigns were funded by uh, Ford, General Motors, like, you know, to uh, Toyota, Honda, Nissan. They spent each of them spent four to five million dollars creating this garbage. They also said that right to repair supports redlining and racism, like as if, you know, a mechanic being able to fix your car somehow has anything to do with segregation and housing. They like they throw the kitchen sink at anybody that tries to say you should be able to fix what you own. And it's disgusting. And it's something that every brand does. So can you tell me that when you're talking about like modern trucks not being repairable, a lot of people think about this in terms of cards and more so consumer cards. They don't really think of how horribly this affects every other field. And the thing that I've really tried been trying to get into people's heads over the past three to four years is like, this isn't just Apple. This isn't just Tesla. This is virtually every company. And you can't scapegoat one or two or three companies or one or two types of industries for something that everybody's doing. So when you talk about the 1969 device that was, you know, every nut and bolt you could work on and the modern ones you can't, can you give some common examples of where the, of the, the most egregious ones? Okay, let's uh, look at a turn signal, for example. So that turn signal in my 1962 Kenworth is the same turn signal as my 81 Kenworth. It's the exact same turn signal that's on a 2016 Western Star. It, it was an old school turn signal that has been around since the 1950s. And if you wanted to, it's got two screws. You can take the top cover off, re-solder it if it needs to. If you want to buy a new one, it's 40 bucks. Then uh, Western Star went away from it in the integrated dash. Kenworth in the 2000s went into one that's all plastic molded into the integrated dash. It's got a bunch of features on it. And to give you an example on one of my newer trucks, it went down. It's a $400 turn signal, and it was three days out because they didn't have it in stock. Which, three days of downtime, because you can't drive a truck without turn signals. Well, the truck bills out for $3,000 a day. That's what a logging truck goes for. So that's three days waiting for a turn signal. That's $9,000 because that turn signal plus a $500 part that you can't fix, you can't repair. And that turn signal is different than this model because this model has this features on it and we don't have that one because it has this feature. So they make it integrated into the dash and they put a bunch of different features and all the models have different features. And if you plug the wrong one in, well, that doesn't work. 
So you get annoyed with it because by the time things start going like this, they start going around four or five years. Well, uh, I can't lose multiple days of work. My customers can't start, can't wait on a load. Well, I guess I got to go back and I, I got to buy a new truck so that I'm not having these issues because they make tiny little parts fail all over that cause just enough downtime where it starts to be annoying. It starts impacting your bottom line and it's creating these owner operators where you talk to old truck drivers, they could buy a truck. And you, the, all the old timers would tell me when I was starting out, when I was just started driving truck. Well, eventually you become an owner operator, you, you pay your truck off and then you can make some good money because then you don't have that truck payment. But now it's trapping people into these truck payments and there's no reason for it because it doesn't make any sense. Like even for the parts wise, why is that plastic one? It's plastic. It should be cheaper than the old school metal one that you could repair yourself. So the old one was 40 bucks, 50 bucks and the new one's 400 bucks. It, it, it just, it makes no sense to me. And it's, Aside from the obvious thing that makes no sense to me, which is instead of have three days of downtime, why not just get a BMW driver operate the truck without the turn signal? Is uh, what about uh, when it comes to the standards? Um, to, what what is it that makes like is that when you say that's out of stock for three days? Is that like a specific turn signal for that specific model truck, or is this a thing where like you could otherwise take a turn signal from another truck, but it won't work in this one because it needs like the serial number pad or something? Because I don't understand the type of BS, for lack of a better way to put it, that happens in automotive. I know in my industry what it is, which is like I I would be able to take this part from this and put it in here, but I can't do that because it has front, because it needs a calibration routine that I don't get access to. So, what is it that makes it makes you require the like a, a three day wait time to get something like that? So the old school one and the one that that old one I'm talking about, it used to just go around the steering column and you tighten two bolts around the steering column. Or you'd put a pipe clamp around it. And if you were cheap like I was, you'd put a pipe clamp around it. That would hold it. So it was a separate part. But now it's integrated into the dash in plastic. And it's a molded plastic cover. And it, it covers the steering column. So you don't see that big, ugly steering column you see in the old ones. And of course, because of that, it's got plastic mounts with two little plastic tabs. That it goes in there and it's got a form in there. So you can't just attach the old one in there. And now it's communicating on a CAN bus network instead of on an analog network. So when one thing, so when that goes down, it takes everything else down with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. That that sounds like a MacBook. Is this whole there's this whole meme of you get uh, like a little bit of liquid in your trackpad and it winds up turning off your SMC. Like there are many laptops uh, on there where if you get liquid in the keyboard, some of your keys won't work. But you plug in a USB keyboard and it works. But with a MacBook, like you get liquid in your Z key and it shorts the power roll to ground. It powers the semantic controller. It it shorts the uh, the SMC to ground. It'll short like it, it, it. Literally everything will stop working. Uh, you, you you won't even get a light on your charger anymore. Or like with the newer MacBooks, you have four charging ports, but if one of the CD3215s that controls the the charging port stops working, all of your charge ports stop working. So if something goes wrong with one of you, the more charge ports you have, the worse off you are, because the greater your chance that one of those chips will fail because you have more of those chips. So the more charge ports you have, the greater your chance of having a machine that actually can't charge. Which kind of, That's so it, insane. But it, 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 like, it's one of these things where the more I speak with people in other industries, the more that I realize that it is not the MacBook that is my enemy. It is not Apple that is my enemy. It is, the, is that the, um, it is that the world is turning into a MacBook. And it's the quarterly of, profit. They're yeah. worried about making a quarterly profit for the shareholders. How are we going to make a little bit more money this month? How are we going to increase sales a little bit more? Yeah, so this brings me to my question, which is like, you know, for be like devil's advocate is, it, okay, what would you say to people that say, well, listen, that, that allows the vehicle to be made cheaper, which allows us to throw all the bullshit technology into it, which you want anyway. You know, like when my parents bought like their car, like, you know, the Delta, I think it was like a Delta 88 Oldsmobile in like the late 80s, it was like 20 or 23,000 bucks. And now inflation has absolutely gone off, a, you know, up it's, yeah, then. It's and, it's cheap. and you could still make, and you could still get a car for like 18 or 20,000 bucks rather than a car being 60 or 80. Is would your way of creating a vehicle result in something that's not economically viable for the end customer? No, it's the opposite for whatever reason. So I talk about that old 1969 Kenworth. I bought it off the original owner. So that guy bought it brand new back in uh, 1968. And he, it, he still had the original bill of sale. He bought it for about 18,500 bucks and inflationary adjusted. That works out to about 150 to 200,000 now, depending on how you measure it. That same truck now, if I go into Kenworth, be about 400, 500,000 dollars. And so it's somehow now twice the price. And when we found when we manufactured ours, so 
because we use those common off the shelf, like I use standard type 30, 30 brake pots. I use that old turn signal when we were in number one, it saved us a lot of money in engineering because we didn't have to design every single part. We just used parts that were commonly available off the shelf. But when we go to sell our truck, we're actually cheaper now than the uh, Freightliner E-Cascadia. So the Freightliner E-Cascadia that's built with all these plastic parts, built all this way, supposed to be assembled all this way, is now more expensive than our truck that's built by hand by a team of mechanics in a garage using common parts. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't. You would think that the, the whole Toyota way of manufacturing and the whole like lean production line and all this stuff with lean supply chain would result in them having, especially even just with economies of scale, them being able to destroy you. Like, you know, I remember when back uh, 14 years ago when I started a supply company and I was trying to compete with these companies that were ordering 10,000 or 100,000 screens at a time. Well, I was only ordering three or 500. They were able to bury me because, you know, like I was making $1 a sale. They were making three. You know, it seems like a small difference, but when you multiply it over hundreds of thousands of sales, they were able to absolutely destroy me. And like it, it, the fact that you can even remotely as a team of like, no offense, but like, you know, yeah, no, guys, no, no offense, like, like, like compete with compete on price with that is is insane. So like get, getting to that part. So like the first thing I'm reading about you is. You know, you said you or you pre-ordered a Tesla Semi in 2017. Yeah, and yeah. You got like, like like many people that, that deal with Elon Musk, you got tired of waiting for something that never showed up. Uh, and uh, like you decided to, you know, start on your own. So can you talk a little about about, about that process and yeah. how it started? And well, I'm honestly interested in hearing about all the failures along the way. Because oh, we failed a bunch. But. Cause, like the thing is, most, yeah, like a lot of people don't realize that people that do things that are exceptionally successful at work, like what you do, they it wasn't like it just came to them magically it's usually like oh yeah this is the 18th iteration but the first 17 iterations did this and I'm, I'm very curious to hear about that entire process okay yeah so we reserved a Tesla semi we we're actually i got the little reservation thing i'm the uh third or fourth person in canada to actually reserve a tesla semi and uh to about third fourth person to reserve a tesla semi and in canada and we got excited and then we started looking into it and then we started seeing more videos and checking things. Well, I don't like the way this is done. And if we get this truck, I would change this. And if I get that truck, then this is how I would do this. And we're like, and then I remember thinking like, okay, well, the power requirements isn't there. So like I put it like, what if we put a little generator on it, like a freight train? And we started looking into, uh, into the, what the sawmill was using. So the, the sawmill in Merritt has three old Laterno loaders and they're all electric. Well, they're diesel electric. One's from 1967, 1969, 71, and they're all unloading two, 300 trucks a day for the logs with electric. I'm like, well, that's electric, and it's been running for 50 years, unloading all these hundreds of trucks a day. What if I copied a little something like this? And that's how I did it. And I was saying it on social media. And, I, and finally, someone says, well, why don't you build your own truck? And I said, screw it, I will. I'll do my own truck. And like, I didn't think it would take off the way it did. Okay, so can you give me an idea? Because like I, I haven't done any sort of logging or anything like that ever. Uh, pretty yeah. much, yeah. I grew up in New York, so like, give me, give me an idea of what what these these trucks are used for, and like, and like, what what is somebody doing with them over the course of their day? Like, I'm and you also and how much how are you powering them? Like, how much of this is like diesel being converted to electric versus just pure electric? I'm, I'm and batteries. Like, I'm I'm very curious about that every aspect of this okay well i was saying like electric for logging made the most sense in bc because all the trees are up at the top of the mountain so you're coming downhill loaded and you're going up empty so you could use the regenerative braking to come down the hill to recharge the batteries to get the mill and then you go back up empty so you barely use any power to go up and you regenerate a lot of power coming down and you're off-road these trucks get beaten up we're loaded to 140 150 000 pounds of logs on a dirt road up in the mountains where we get up to 30% grades, like three times steeper than you would ever see on a highway, in the dirt, in the snow, like it gets beaten up. <laughs> okay, and so if you're at the top of a hill and you're loading thousands of pounds of stuff on and then going back down, and I can see what you're talking about, with, um, you know, essentially almost free energy there. I can't say that yeah. Dave Jones is going to kill me. Well, you're using you get the idea. But yeah, like the, what, what's the fancy way? You're using the stored potential energy of yes. the logs, turning it into downhill gravity. kinetic yeah, energy. Yeah, or gravity. Energy. Yeah, it yeah. Is, it is not. It is not scam uh, free energy. It's I not just, free energy. It's it actually it's carbon negative energy if you think about it, because the the trees are growing. They're taking CO two out of the atmosphere, and as the trees go, it stores the CO two, and then you come down. So we're using stored sequestered CO two to power our electric vehicle. <laughs> actually. Uh, 
there's got to be a buzzword there. I just thought of that. That's okay, got to so, be a way. But. So like how much of, uh, of let's say, the, you know, the vehicle that's doing that is like, how, how much of that is pure electric and battery versus like how many kilowatt hours do you have in, the, in those trucks versus so, like uh, being powered off of a gen diesel and generator? We put about 280 kilowatt hour batteries packs in our truck. And the generator, so we downsized from, normally a truck has a 15 liter engine. We downsized to a nine liter engine. You get about two hours of run time for about half an hour to one hour of generator time, if that kind of makes sense. And we charge at about 300 kilowatts. You said about 280 kilowatts, a 200 kilowatt hour battery? Yeah, 280. Okay, that's big. It, it's, it's pretty big, It's but it's not when you compare it to all the other electric trucks um out there that are pushing 600 800 thousand kilowatt hours we don't need as big a battery we can either do 200 to 300 depending on your application and how much electric drive you want versus how much we can what can we go down to air for the belt bottom 180 that's where it's super light we can go to 140 140 that was a minimum yeah, yeah and the thing that i found okay interesting is like okay to correct me if i'm wrong but for this type of logging work it's not like you're going cross country you're not like no. you're not taking lobsters from maine and bringing them to tennessee or something no, you're you know? driving 100 miles to the mill okay so that that works because like the one question i was going to ask you is it seems like there was this exponential thing where it gets way more and more difficult because the energy density of lithium-ion batteries is, is, is shit like yeah. where it's kind of a, like it, it, it's efficient uh in terms of like what how much you waste versus gas but like gas is so so energy dense and it's, it, it almost doesn't matter because it's so light. So I was wondering how you were dealing with that problem as a truck. And I guess the answer is a giant, a battery that's like three or four times the size of what you get in a Tesla and you're not going really long distances. Because like the thing that I find is kind of funny is when they try to pretend that this is kind of semi -vi like viable when you have like when they're putting similar to Tesla size batteries in a Ford F-150 Lightning and then like, you know, you try to haul something and you yeah. Know, like there was a guy that that, that did, did this and he's showing like, you know, he's go, every mile he goes, he's losing like three or four yeah. miles of range. And he wasn't even doing it in the cold. And like, it just becomes a joke. But like you found a way to make this actually very viable, but it actually makes sense for what you're doing. Because A, it's not long distance, but more importantly, you're going up a very, very large hill with nothing. And you're going down the hill with thousands of pounds of shit. So this is literally the, the ideal scenario to have an electric motor because you're actually making very good use of all that regenerative braking power going down, which is... But even in that scenario, it's still not enough power just off batteries alone. Like we put a diesel generator in it. So it's like a freight train. How a hybrid. It's a, yeah, it's a plug-in <laughs> hybrid. It, it's a plug-in. Instead of running a 15 liter diesel 100% of the time, you're now running a nine liter diesel half the time. Like in a logging application, you can see a 70, 80% reduction in fuel mileage. So in a logging truck will burn $1,000 a day in fuel up in Canada. That's... 500, 700 bucks a day fuel savings. And you're running a small generator at just one RPM. You're not lugging it. So you got all the power, all the torque. You can take advantage of the regen instead of a Jake break, just make a noise. So it was just, we thought about it and it's the next logical step in the EV. Like everyone wanted to go full EV, full battery. That's it. We're going to go right from full diesel to full EV. And EV, when we did the math, that's when we were looking at the Tesla. And we started doing the math and started looking at like what the power requirements were. And you look at a logging truck and you see that the power requirements on a logging truck, notwithstanding regen braking, putting it in there, but you're looking at about two and a half megawatts per day. The Tesla Semi is estimated to be around a thousand kilowatt hours. We need 2,500. So we would need two and a half times the size of a Tesla Semi battery just to even make the logging truck do a full day shift which means that I would need to pack 60,000 pounds of batteries. Yeah, 50. it doesn't make, it, 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 the more of a load you want to carry, the less sense it winds up making. Yeah. And it's like, it, it gets exponentially worse. Yeah, exactly. And it, by doing a little hybrid, we just combined the both the best of both worlds because we ended up losing weight on the truck because the weight reduction on the motor was 2,000 pounds. The batteries weighed about 1,500 pounds transmission and everything so on our first truck we lost about 200 300 pounds worth of weight reduction that's that's a very impressive and the fact that you're able to do that while simultaneously making it like somewhat affordable and also efficient efficient and it's i i do stand by that we used off the shelf parts for that it that was the biggest thing yeah, and one of the things that i've been like really driving home to my audience because they keep saying like fuck evs evs suck you buy an ev you're a dumbass you're a pussy whatever is is like the thing that drives me the most nuts is that like the electric motor this is over 100 year old technology yeah. like what i tell people is do not blame the tech blame the manufacturer 
Like smartphone, there's nothing about a smartphone that requires that you not be able to install an operating system of your choice. That manufacturer, like Samsung decided to lock the bootloader and not allow you to unlock the bootloader in your phone. You used to be able to do that. Now you can't. Uh, you know, the electric ve you know, vehicle manufacturers, the fact that this has an electric motor does not mean that it also has to be locked down, that everything inside it has to be a subscription, that you not be able to access anything inside of it, that you have to have like what Mercedes have with the EQS, where you have a warning saying, do not open your hood when you get on the <laughs> yeah. screen. Like this, the, all of this stuff is not unique. Like, I, you know, I love electric motors. I had so much fun, you know, playing with the, the, all these different types of e-bike motors. And like, I find that a lot of fun. I have a, I have a controller at home. I think it's based in the ASI BAC 800. It's a phase runner. I can adjust my own PID loop if I want. Like, yeah. There's all sorts of crazy stuff I could do. So there's this idea that if I buy an electric vehicle, I have to give up freedom. That's simply the way it is. And they're just so intertwined and linked. And what I love about what you've done is you've proven literally the exact opposite is the case. And I like seeing that 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 pushback against it because it, it because normal vehicle manufacturers like all of this stuff is going to come to internal combustion engine vehicles because all the stuff you're talking about with a lot of these trucks that are less repairable nowadays than what they used to be all, all of that is happening on things that do not have you know a battery bigger than the soldering iron yeah and they're they're using the electrification and the oh scary batteries as a way like there's so many things like you cannot open the hood of this Mercedes. No, you cannot work on your electric vehicle at all. It's dangerous. It's got batteries. And that's true. The batteries are dangerous. You, you can get killed by the batteries, but you can get killed by high voltage working in a sawmill. But you know what they do? They have a, electricians at a sawmill where they have all those three phase electrical motors and it's lockout tag out procedures. You lock out the power. So you disconnect the power. You put a lock on it. Nobody can re-energize this power. And then you verify that the power is out. You put your voltmeter, you put your safety gloves on. You put your voltmeter on one end. You put your voltmeter on the part you're working on. Yes, I see zero volts, zero amps. It's now safe to work on. You just need to train lockout. Every industrial mechanic, industrial electrician knows lockout, tagout procedures. But all these auto manufacturers are saying that, no, we there's no way that our mechanics can learn or any other mechanics can learn lockout, tagout. You got to bring it to our shop because only our mechanics can do lockout, tagout. And it's BS. It's just a way that you have to go back to Ford. You have to put their software on it. You have to pay their things. And you're seeing that I've talked to people that have bought electric trucks and you can see exactly where it is. Like on the electric semi side there, it'll be even be in the shop. And they say, oh, well, you you that's an electric truck. Our normal shop rates 200, but it's 450 an hour for the electric truck shop rate because we need a specialist to work on this electric truck. So you got to pay over two and a half times the price of the rate. By the way, it's a four or five hour minimum. And you're like, well, I just need a brake job done. And you're like, no, it's an electric truck. It's still going to be 400 bucks an hour to service the brakes on that electric truck just because it could be dangerous and we don't know where the high voltage is. So nobody else can work on it. And they try and lock out as many things as you can. Don't repair anything. It's unsafe. And it's just, it's a BS way of making you pay more. Yeah, and one of the things we were talking about before we even started the video that I think is worth going over again is like that every single time we enter a new technological paradigm, there's some way to take away freedom in the name of safety and security. Like like with that, like you know, you may get raped in a parking lot if you have an independent be able to fix your car. But let's just forget about the fact that all the data being stored in your car is being done by the manufacturer that actually fought in court for the ability to continue doing that. And in Washington, they actually saw said that that didn't break any privacy laws, which absolutely blows my effing by. But like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll remind me to link that video down below when I'm done with this, because that's there was one case I went over with a with this uh, Washington uh, judge said that the car manufacturers take essentially what they do is they take all the data from your phone, like when you're syncing should be a Bluetooth message and all that. You can't delete that. And apparently the reason that the plaintiffs were not able to get their complaint forward is because they had not been harmed yet by it. So like you have to wait. And so, so you have to wait until they actually show your wife the texts that you were sending your girlfriends and blackmail you. Through. Then you can make a claim. But anyway, it, it, that's like somebody pointing a gun in your face and be like, well, this guy's got a gun in my face. I don't like this guy pointing a gun at me. You'll be like, well, you got to wait until he actually shoots you before you complain about it. That's yeah. insane. Yeah, well, like, to, to, to the point, is, but the, the, what, I was trying, what I was trying to get to, and then I went off on a tangent like I always do. I got to step back. Me too. Back. I'm, I'm it, so bad. Yeah, it's so. like, the, the, there's, when we're like when we were kids, we we're around the same generation, like in 1993, 1990, even 1994, like, I would tell my parents, like, as, as long as I wasn't a complete delinquent, like, you know, I'm going to go out and play with my friends. I'm going to go on my bike. Okay, cool. Come back before sundown. I didn't have a beeper. The only people who had beepers in 1993 were drug dealers and Wall Street people. Not, not, not like eight or 10 year olds. You know, I was able to go outside. We were able to have like play on our own. And like, like my dad did not really know exactly where I was. He had no way of ascertaining it. He couldn't call me. And it was like, 
whatever. And now, like, I mean, they, almost everybody that I knew that was a parent, like the idea of doing that is insane. And like, I think that we've gotten we've gone to this point. It's not even necessarily about repair. It's not about repairing cars. It's not about repairing tractors. It's not about repairing cell phones and computers. We've gotten to this point of just infant, infantilizing people in general to the point where we, again, like if you just look at it generationally, like you're allowed to fix a Ford F-150's brake pads. This can go 80 miles an hour down the highway. This weighs over 4,000 pounds. You can fix this in your driveway and nobody blinks an eye. But like Lewis replaces a 3.7 volt, one cell lithium ion battery for a cell phone. God forbid the world could end. It's like there's always a risk of danger. And we've always accepted that there is a risk of danger. There's always risks and rewards. Like in that video on the, the Hyundai, the $60,000 car battery. You know what? Yeah, there may be one person that winds up having a horrible experience in a vehicle as a result of it being repaired improperly out of hundreds of thousands of millions of vehicles. But if the alternative is every single time you get a little bit of rocks that hit the bottom of the cover of your car, you just throw that away and pay $60,000. There's also a societal cost to that. That that if it only saves one life, bullshit. That I you know moved seventeen hundred miles to get away from. The, the, the whole idea that like there that we cannot consider any other factor if it saves one life. Like that, that's the only thing we're looking at. That's just kind of gotten ridiculous. And I I hate that because it's if it saves one life because there's so many times where you just see it. Okay, it might save one life, but then what about somebody else? And it causes negative externalities elsewhere that can hurt somebody. Like, now, you can't protect everybody. And at some point, you just got to be able to say, you're on your own, bud. I mean, if every farmer is going to be waiting, let's say, a week or two for a dealer technician to come out and they have downtime, that, that, that's going to have a that's going to have a negative impact on the cost of food. There are so many mil there's so many millions of potential externalities that can occur that are not very easy to measure once you decide that something that would otherwise be two to six hundred dollars now needs to cost sixty thousand dollars in the name of safety and security. And like no, it's very easy to to like fetishize safety and security to the point of using it as an excuse to for every single reason to deny somebody the ability to work on what they own. Yeah. And like I, I don't I don't I genuinely I don't even believe it's like it's a laptop thing, a cell phone thing, a tractor thing, a medical device thing. Uh, it, it it's I feel like it's a cultural thing of like just. Yeah, that's high voltage. That's dangerous. I mean, well, like, you know, this vehicle also has, you know, gasoline flowing. through. There's so many things that you can do that could kill you six ways to Sunday servicing an internal combustion engine vehicle. I've been saying, like, if it was the opposite and we had electric vehicles brought out when freedom was big back in the 1920s and somebody tried to bring out a gas motor now, somebody would come out and there'd be some Karen that says, no, 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 no. You can't service a fuel tank. You can't fill your own car. You could spill fuel. That's flammable. That can create a fire. We can't allow that. You got to go to, a, it, we're going to come out with a gas car or a diesel car and you can only fill it up at a Ford dealership and only our technicians will be allowed to fill your gas car. I would 100% believe that they would do that I if mean, we if you came did, out with gas cars. If you just search YouTube, like for just these three words, the cigarette gas station, like <laughs> you'll see a lot of, like, I mean, yeah, I, I could completely see where you're coming from. Or like, if, if if the if the internal combustion engine vehicle came out after the electric vehicle, what if somebody smokes a cigarette at a gas station? What if this? What if that? There's so many things that could potentially happen, and like it drives me nuts. I, I get it. Like there are issues. There are ways that if you service an electric vehicle improperly, people can get hurt. Yeah. But you know, if you service an internal combustion engine improperly, people can get hurt. These trucks are twenty thousand pounds. They go eighty miles an hour. They carry all sorts of stuff. They do not stop very quickly. And it has like you know, it has uh, liquid inside of it that can go on fire. Like yeah. there's so many things that could go wrong if you're doing a frame repair on this rust repair, like any sort of repair after any sort of collision. And we we accept that risk as a society because we believe that throwing away something that costs sixty thousand or two hundred thousand dollars to build over something basic is bullshit. Yeah. Like th there is a cost to that that we we used to have the common sense to know not to do that. So this brings me to the question on your on everything that you're putting together. What are you doing differently than everybody else to ensure that your devices are repairable? And what are the frustrations that people have with other devices in your industry that they won't have when they buy your stuff? Well, we used off-the-shelf parts. That was a big one. It's like, well, you look, it's a small team. We don't have a bunch of engineers. So we looked at our old trucks and I had a lot of old trucks from the 60s and 70s and they're all using, trucks were really standardized back in the day. It didn't matter whether it was a Freightliner, a Mac, a Western Star. They used the same brake pots, the same turn signals. It was actually mandated by the government back then uh, because, long story short, they were worried after World War II, they bombed all the German factories. 
and they were worried the Soviets were going to bomb the factories over here. And well, if they bomb the factories, trucks are so important to national defense, national supply. People starve to death if we don't have trucks. If our factories get bombed in a war, we need to be able to repair by pulling parts off of this truck, pulling parts off of this truck. So they standardized it, and it was standard basically up until the 1980s. So you've seen all these trucks have the same parts. They've been mass produced, so they're cheap because the patents have all expired on these parts. People mass produce the parts. They're still used all over the world. You can get the parts anywhere for cheap. So when we looked and designed it, we said, well, why are we going to make our own? Why am I going to build my own $1,400 headlight assembly? I'll just go buy that $30 headlight assembly that's in all these other trucks, and I'll put that on there. I'll buy that brake pod. I'll break, buy those brake pads, and we'll put those together. So... The result is, is it saved us a lot of money in engineering. It saved us a lot on production costs. It allowed us to get a truck built built quicker because we didn't have to build custom parts on the truck. We just, we immediately started at the assembly phase. Engineering, we didn't have to build parts. We just went straight to building after engineering. And then the result is, is that now when these trucks are on the road, people can walk into like an industrial supply store. Like we went to go look at that old Laterno from the sixties. What parts do they have? What parts does my local industrial supply, electrical supply store have? We use those parts. So I like to say that Edison is one of the few companies where we could totally go bankrupt. Like as an EV company, Edison Motors could go under. We're a small company. It's a risk. But if somebody buys one of our trucks, they're still going to be able to get the parts everywhere for the truck. So we've had people call me from other EV companies where... They've said, hey, I bought this EV. Can you work on it? And like, I bought an EV from this company blank. They've gone out of business. Can you work on my bus and fix my bus for me? I said, well, no, they've locked all the parts out. I can't even access it. I can't reprogram it. There is nothing I can do to help you. Like, I, I don't have access. With ours, it's all the same parts. And I can send a parts list where to show you like the ESOF Pacific trucks back in the day went out of business in the 1990s. I bought a Pacific gravel truck two years ago. Some of the guys at Pacific still have the parts. And when I bought a truck, the owner of that truck phoned Pacific to let them know I bought it. Then Pacific called me and said, do you need the parts book or anything for this truck? I got the whole parts assembly. So this is a company that hasn't been in business for 30 years. And they gave me the entire parts list of everything on the truck so I can keep that truck going. And when I was talking to the owner of the Pacific trucks, he said that 50% of every truck that they made since the 1960s till the 1980s are still on the road today because they did that. Our trucks are going to be the same way. With the same parts, you can go into the same supply store, pick up those parts, change it. We haven't locked anything out from the software. We've made the software open. It's available. You can change what you want on it. You may void a warranty. We'll say that. Like, yeah, if you, if you want to massively change your parameters, and we don't recommend them. You probably void your warranty, but I'm not going to stop you from doing that. It's it's your risk. If you want to say, well, I want to just overpower this truck and have insane power all the time, we'll say you probably shouldn't, but you can. But that means that if we go under, there's a lot of smart people that can look at code. So even if you couldn't even get somebody from Edison, you can take it to whatever shop, look at the code, and oh, I'll read that, rewrite that for you. We don't lock it out. How about it? That's awesome. Okay, so how much of your business right now is like building these from scratch versus retrofitting existing trucks with, with all your equipment and the way that you make them? So we built the um, first truck was from scratch, frame rails up because we wanted to prove it. But now we're going a lot back into the retrofit. So we're building another five semi trucks next year because I want to go a little bit slower and we're retrofitting a few. So we're doing one retrofit, three new builds. And then on the pickup side, we're going to be doing four or five retrofits because I am not going down that nightmare of new truck builds. I do not have that kind of money right now. <laughs> Semi trucks are surprisingly easy. Okay. So you're, you're taking existing trucks and like you're adding this technology to them, the diesel generator, electric motors yeah. and everything else. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So you're essentially, you know, the whole like reuse, recycle, renew, well, repair, like you, you're reusing shit that already exists and just making it better and more efficient. Like this, this is what, this is what EV technology should be doing. Like yeah. you should be able to take your old shit box and make it able to use regenerative braking and, well, rather than throw it away when every all the all the internal combustion engine components die inside of it like this is really cool 100 percent. i get so mad because everybody says like well you need to go ev to save the planet lower your emissions but then the ev car lasts for four or five years and then you throw it out and you buy another ev how is that better for the planet if it's just a piece of junk you throw out and they're mandating that we have to buy electric vehicles in canada by all by 2035 100 of the vehicles on the sold in canada have to be electric but if they only last four or five years, and instead of getting 10, 20 years out of it, 
Well, how is that better for the environment? when you could retrofit it. If you got a truck with good bones, good frame rails, good body, but you put, you're a trucker, you're working it, you've been putting on the miles, your engines wore out, transmission rear ends are wore out, why not just take it in, switch it. I'll put a diesel generator, I'll put some batteries in the frame rail, I'll switch the rear ends, and you got another good truck, good to last you another 10, 20 years. Yeah, it's much, and it's a lot more efficient that way. Yeah, and like, even with batteries, that's the one question we got. Yeah, batteries, technology is getting better, it's not there yet. So what what do you do? What are you using for batteries right now? Like I imagine you're not. Are you, are you sitting there like making your own bus rails and everything, or is this like some other solution? So there's enough companies that just sell batteries, and you can buy a full battery modules for like eight thousand bucks, and we just put them in the frame rails, so they're protected. They're in the frame rails. We didn't lock them in custom things. You got to take the whole cab and do everything else to get it expensive. If you have a battery issue, so say ten years down the line, you got a battery that's worn out. You need a new battery. Well, maybe you need two. Eight to sixteen thousand dollars. You're looking at an engine rebuild in ten years. Pop them out, put them back in. It's a three hour job. You're back on your way. It's not sixty thousand dollars because I got to rip the whole cab off with custom battery. Like that's that's how they get you. Are, are you using it? Out of I, I really should have done some more research before asking you, even asking you this question. But are you using like lithium polymer or lithium ion? Lithium iron. Okay. So like, what are you doing for like heating and cooling? So they got heat pads in them naturally, so that heats them. But because in Canada. We're cheating a little bit because it's a hybrid with diesel. So if you need additional cooling, we can use a diesel fired heater, heat the coolant lines, and we can flow warm fluid right through it. All right, cool. Because yeah, like, it's it's not even so much the output. It's like if you try to charge lithium ion batteries below a certain you can you use can. a lithium ion battery below a certain temperature. You can output. Output just fine. When you try to charge them below a certain temperature that you start getting into like serious shit and yeah, you normally the BMS, if it's below zero degrees Celsius, thirty-two Fahrenheit, will just stop the charge. It won't let you if the BMS is working and doing its job, it'll say the battery cell temperature is below zero degrees, so I'm not gonna let you charge it. And then the battery heat pads warm up, and there's a couple cool things you can do. Like we do have some CAN bus stuff in there. It's not all analog. You have to go with CAN bus to monitor. And there's cool things, but it, the heat pads will turn on. They'll start warming the batteries. If it's real cold, minus 30 below, that warm glycol can start flowing through there constantly. And then it allows a charge. Uh, one thing I'm curious about when it comes to how you're locking these or not locking them is I, I remember speaking to an engineer for a major car company. I'm not going to say who because you know, he's forming a secrecy here. But when I was talking about like, you know, being able to modify my PID loop on my on the Z-Bike motor, and there was one point when I was messing with integral gain. And usually I have like my proportional gain set to like 2.5, 2.7, and my integral gain set to 10. And, you know, the default is I think like 0.7 uh, proportional gain and like integral gain was like 300. And I had a typo. Instead of typing in 300, I typed in 3,000. Um, you can imagine uh, how, how this went. So I, I, I touched the throttle just to test it without anything else happening. That Before I even noticed that the chain was essentially it, it hit so hard that it like before the wheel even moved, the chains broke. It flew. It cut a chunk of skin off the side of my knee. It left a hole in the drywall. Of uh -huh. the room that I'm in, and one of the things that he was saying is, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have to tell you this, but you could have, if you, if you make that mistake with the vehicle that he's responsible for engineering, which is a major vehicle for a major brand, if you, if you're able to set your own PID loop, it would be, if you enter a typo, what could happen is the wheels will come off of, instead of you move the car moving forward, the wheels will shoot off of the car and will go through the wall of the building in front of you. Um, and like, so I'm it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. So like it, it, it is it now as much as I am all for user freedom in every way, like there are, it's, if you're tuning like your 1972 Ford Mustang, I don't know, you tour barge, whatever, the, all the shit that you can do to that, you're not, you can make it go faster and you could probably screw things up by making it go faster, but you're not at the point where like the wheel is literally, you don't have the potential to shoot the wheel off of the car so fast that it's actually going to go through the building in front of you. So like how much, if at all, is any of your stuff locked down so that if somebody is logging in there and being a dipshit like me, that they don't wind up doing that? Or is that just... So uh, the one way, so we have the basically the driver information displays that come up, the tablet where you can access everything. And like we show all fault codes, everything on there. But the way we can do it is you can enter like the owners or mechanics things and you can adjust the speed, you can adjust the charging, like how, what's my acceleration time that I'm going to allow the driver, what's the top speed. So there's an onboard thing where we already know what the safe parameters are and we let it play it with. But how we're not locking it down is on the other side is it, it's not like the code is locked down where you can't access it, you can't like, you don't have to really hack into it. If somebody knows how to plug into a computer, if I get the code, rewrite the code, they can. 
Number one, because I think you should be able to if you're allowed it. Now, I am not going to warranty your truck. And you are on your own if you change that and you go into it. But it's open source. You can get it. You can find out what it is. You can play with all the parameters. You can start changing things. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can blow it up. And as far as I'm concerned, it's your property. You own it. If you want to destroy it, you probably can. You, I have given you the physical ability to do it. I haven't locked it down, which means that if you want to change things and if you have an error where you know what? I don't like that inverter. I found this inverter in the shop. I want to program it and I need to make this inverter work. And you got a guy that's good on computers. Perfect. He can program that one if he knows what he's doing. The average person, normally when somebody can do that stuff, they know what they're doing. They can double check their things. It's not accessible to the average person that doesn't know, but it is accessible for a guy that does know. That's kind of how we do that balancing act is that if you're smart enough to get into it, I'm not going to lock you out of it. But I'm hoping if you're smart enough to get into it, you're smart enough to know what you're doing. And if not, that's on you. I'm smiling because I'm the exception to this rule that I know. No, I, I you should have seen our guys. I, I am definitely not the smart one here because there's been so many times where I'm like, can we do this? And they're like, no, but that's more power. Yeah, I know how to get into the menu, but I'm a complete idiot as soon as I get into it. And I'd be the person that was like sending their wheels through a building. So my follow up question to that is how many of these trucks have had their wheels fly through buildings, go on fire? you know, get destroyed horribly because you have this pro freedom mindset that every other automaker says they can't have because of safety and security. I mean, we've what had, are your stats? We've had zero. No, nobody's done that. Like we played around with different things and I've definitely left rubber on things and all that. And people have, people have played, people have had fun, but normally when you're dealing with something like an RC car or something, a little smaller motor and people play around when people are dealing with a $300,000 truck, they tend to be a little bit more like I guess we're not at the point where these have been available to the general public long enough or anything like that where people have been able to hack in but yeah somebody could do something like that but it's like way I look at it is you got to think about it in a safety aspect it's like you could be dangerous you could do something dangerous you could other hurt other people you could hurt yourself you could go out, you could buy a shotgun and you could massively damage somebody. So by overpowdering it or firing it off in a dangerous spot, but you don't say let's ban all the shotguns because somebody might do something dumb with one at some point. You say that, hey, no, we're going to teach somebody how to use it responsibly. And if they don't, that's on them. I look at it the same way as that. It's Yeah, you're definitely in the right state to say that part out loud. Uh, but the, the thing that gets me the most is like the, the idea that Nobody should be able to have the freedom to be able to do this because you're all too stupid and you're all going to do stupid things with freedom. And what I like about the, your company is that you've essentially given people all of that ability and all of that freedom. And they've kind of like re repaid you and for, for it by not doing something st horribly stupid with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that's continue. But if they do, people do stupid things. People do stupid things. I can't control it, what people do. And it's I believe that somebody does have that personal freedom. Like you own the truck. As far as I'm concerned, at the end of the day, how I view it, they buy the truck, they own the truck, they should have a right to do with what they want with the thing they own. Okay, so now what 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 are your plans for the future? I usually hate this question because I very rarely have a plan for anything. I just kind of like YOLO and try to make things work as I go. Um, I, have, I have like a couple of ideas and I try to like have rails so that I don't come completely off. Like what, what are your plans for the future with this? You just... No, we're, uh, yeah, we're building these trucks for a few so we're testing out a few different industries building more trucks and we're just going to keep growing the biggest one we just launched a pickup truck kit a lot of people were saying the same things like we were saying this with the semi trucks and uh, like this is what i want this is why it makes sense and people are like well i got pickup trucks and i want to be i want to do electric i'm interested in electric i'm interested in the hybrid but i sure don't want a ford lightning that i can't work on or doesn't have the range can you do something for the pickup and we started looking at it and like well, we can use the same batteries, but instead of using six batteries, I can use two batteries. Instead of having five inverters, I can have two inverters. We can use the same parts. The axle might be a little bit smaller. The electric motor might be a little bit smaller. But the fundamental, all the things like the fuses, the relays, all of that can be the same part. So we could just make the same kit for pickup. So we just launched that one. Wow. Uh, but um, we just ordered the parts for the first pickup and we're going to start building it here. Hopefully they should be showing up in May. So what are you retrofitting? You said like did that, did that, I imagine you're retrofitting existing uh, internal combustion engine pickup trucks. Yeah. Make them electric. Like, well, what are the, some of your first few projects? Uh, so one guy uh, we're working with, uh, DeBoss Garage there, he bought a 2006 Chevy 3500 Dually. 
one of our other installers that are going to be ins helping us install these kits. He went out when he heard what we were doing and immediately went to the auction and bought a service truck with a blowing motor. So all the tool cabinets, like he bought an F550 service truck. Wow. And then the one we're doing, we're still debating, like somebody's singing like an old, old uh, body style Ford. I kind of want to do, do up like a 1952 Dodge Power Wagon. If the jury's still out. We're still debating. Like, I, I think something cool from the 50s with like 500 horsepower. Like, it's got 500 horsepower, 8,000 foot pounds of torque. And I think that'd be sweet in a 1950s truck. That's awesome. So, what, what does that cost? Like, the kit by itself? Or, like, do you, do you actually, do you sell the kit or do you just like sell kit with installation service? Like, how does that work? Uh, so we just started partnering up with some installers now. So we're training up these installers and that's what we're going to be doing over the next year, year and a half is training up these guys on how to work with it. Cause I didn't like the way that small shops were getting pushed out of the industry by all these big shops. You can see that what they're doing with EV is that you small shops can't work on. It. And I said, that's stupid. So basically, reached out and we got a bunch of smaller shops you know they might have four bays five bays if you want to like start learning on evs we'll teach you up on the edison kit and then because it's not practical to ship all the trucks in north america to merit british columbia canada and then back so i'm like i'll train local guys on how to service evs so if ford and tesla aren't going to start training people on how to service evs i'll do it myself and then they can sell the kits so we'll they can have the kit from us where or the customer can then buy the kit from us and then have it installed through a trained installer and then they can do it or they can have it themselves if they want the option of like hey i want to install this thing myself cool you can buy the kit yourself and do it yourself we're not going to warranty that but it's it's like a the way i view it is you know when you can rebuild an old engine so you can if you got an old diesel engine you can go into cummins and you can buy a rebuild kit like a reman kit and you can tear your own engine down and you can put in new liners new pistons new rings new top end totally redo it yourself and some people can and some people screw it up and blow their engine up but cummins will say i'll sell you the kit but if you blow it up that's on you if you go to a trained cummins rebuilder somebody that's certified we'll give you a three-year warranty with the thing it's a little bit more expensive because you're paying for the guy's skills so if we train somebody, we'll warranty it. If somebody takes it on their own, they can do it themselves. But they should have the right, if they want to, to do it. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm excited for you. Oh, I hope your way wins. I do too. I think it's. I think like every single time you see a story like the like the bullshit Hyundai sixty thousand dollar battery thing, the thing that killed me about that one the most, it's not just that they did it, it's that they tried to take it back after the fact. So I don't know how how much of that story did you follow. I followed a fair okay. bit of it. So like, okay, the where do we even begin? That was an independent dealer that misquoted you. So like at first it's only authorized people can do work. Only uh, only the chosen ones, only the, like the members of our congregation may touch these cars. <laughs> and then the moment they fuck something up, it's, oh yeah, that was an independent. Like, no, bitch, it's one or the other. Like you get to choose, it's this or that. Yep. Which one is it? Like it, it, they're either the only, it's either you're going to get raped in a parking lot if somebody else works on your car or these are independent. Th that's the first one. After that, you have to deal with the fact that like they were, they said, well, that was a misquote, but then they had four separate dealers that gave the exact same quote. And then the third part of it was after all of this came out, they said, okay, cool. We'll give you a discount on the vehicle, uh, on a new vehicle. It's like after all of that came out in, in, in it's gone over in great detail, they still held on to that we cannot replace this metal cover because of safety. I'm kind of curious, how would you deal with something like that? Like, how would the battery, you know, I, I mean, I, I know these are logging trucks. It's not a, you know, a piece of shit consumer sedan. So, like, but how, how are you storing the batteries so that if you go over, uh, like, some road debris or a shitty construction site, like where they're doing construction in my house right now, how are you dealing with that so that that doesn't destroy, you know, break into the battery as a safety issue? I mean, eventually, at one point, you can do it. But we put the uh, batteries on airbags. Like, the truck air suspension rides on airbags. The cab rides on airbags. So we put the batteries on airbags so they're independent of the frame rail. So your batteries can bounce freely. So if they hit a bump, it can bounce it up. And we put a big skid plate under it. Like, I ran with, like, a real thick thick skid plate on the back of that so you can bounce those batteries they'll move up but eventually no matter what you do you could probably destroy something you give something to a logger and say you can't destroy it he will prove you wrong 30 <laughs> minutes later but the best thing you can do is protect it but then have a plan for when it fails what happens when this fails what happens when our protection doesn't work okay perfect well it's on four airbags it's held on with eight bolts i can undo those eight bolts i can lift it off with the sling like 
it already has in the cradle that holds the batteries pre-existing points to attach a sling so that your crane you roll it into the shop you can either drop it through the bottom like a transmission slide it out or you can pick it up from above slide it out but doing a battery re and re is about an hour an hour long job battery eight bolts out battery down with the transmission hoist pull it out like disconnect it roll them out new ones in lift it up re-put your bolts back in reconnect your electrical lines reconnect your coolant lines you're good to go like that's an hour two hour job that's not a eighty thousand dollar sixty thousand dollar battery swap like, i mean it's, it's either one or two things are, tr are true either a they're full of shit or b they're telling the truth and they actually put together a vehicle that is so fucking flimsy that if it goes over a couple of rocks in the road and it gets a little bit of road debris hit, hitting the bottom cover that you now have a bomb like it's one or the other and i don't and like they, they're both horrible <laughs> they're both bad like it's not like one makes them look better and one is like the, no trust me you'll understand after this explanation like either way it's like it, the sad thing is this is like i kind of thought okay maybe hyundai actually came out as kind of anti-subscription and anti all that bullshit earlier in 2023 so i kind of thought eh, you know if i was going to get in something new maybe that and then i just see that happen it's like i will never purchase a hyundai ever no oh, i hate the subscription i have made it very clear very publicly that there is not going to be any subscriptions on the edison truck you're gonna buy the truck and then that's it what if they want a subscription I don't know. They can subscribe to Sirius XM then. <laughs> oh, you don't need a subscription. Like, I hate it. Oh, it's it's one of my biggest things I've been complaining about. So the trucking industry has mandated e-logs. So you legally have to have an electronic log book as part of your truck in order to legally drive the truck on the road. But the OEM doesn't put a log book in the truck. You have to buy a subscription at the log. If I can't legally drive it on the road without that subscription, or out that logbook, why does it have to be a subscription? It should be part of the vehicle. Is this a Canadian thing or a general? You, no, it's a US and Canada oh, thing. Oh. It came out here first. Canadian. Yeah, you have to pay a subscription. Every single semi truck you see on the road now has to legally have a subscription. You bought the truck. It's part of the OEM software. Why do I have to go to a third party to have that why subscription? Can I, why can't I self host or self manage my own lock? Nope, that's totally illegal because then you could alter it. But at the very least, the OEM should be putting out the logbook. Like, why doesn't Kenworth have the logbook with the truck? You just bought a $400,000 truck, and you're telling me you still got to pay $30 a month for the subscription in order to drive the truck? That's disgusting. So what, what, how does yours work? Do you, I mean, if they buy your, uh, one of these retrofitted trucks? We're just putting the logbook in with the system. So okay. we're just putting it in there. It's, it's $60,000 a year for the verification program, but like, well, I'll just eat that cost. And then if somebody wants a different one and they they're not happy with ours, wait, that sixty thousand bucks a year. Yeah, you yeah. have to. We have to be verified. It has to. You have to be a third party, not the person that owns the truck, and you have to pay so much per year. So the government looks at it and says, okay, this does the job. The driver can't alter it. We can't change it. Oh, okay. You guys have a fun evening to get to. I don't want to take up oh, yeah. time. Thank you so much for taking there, time. Oh, no. It was so much fun. This was great. I've yeah. been a huge supporter Thank of you. your work. I, I love yeah. what you do. I really like, again, people always ask, when are you going to give an example of something good? And it's like, where? <laughs> where? Like, like I said, you, you have actually been a huge inspiration on starting this. Like when you started talking wow. about regular to repair and everything like that, before I ever started at Edison Motors, oh, I yeah. loved what you did. I loved you, what you're doing. And I'm like, fucking what? Oh, yeah, no, 100%. And I'm like, if I ever start my own company, that's the way I do it. I do it against that. I was agreeing with you. And I'm like, you know what? I'm tired of EVs. I'm tired of the, I'm like, yeah, Lewis Rossman's right. I'm just going to do it on my, this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to do it without all of this shit. Awesome. And then we figured like the odds of us being successful when we were starting out weren't high. A bunch of loggers working in a tent in Canada. I'm like, very turns out where it's actually taken off but i figured worst case scenario we'll shake up the industry we'll show that you can make a truck with some right to repair we show we'll show it how to make it simple that's why if you watch like our youtube videos we show how every nut and bolt goes into that truck we don't hide anything so that people can see that you can work on it and that everything that these big oems is saying is complete bs but yeah you're a huge inspiration for all that but it's, it's an honor to meet you here it didn't fail after all well i appreciate it <laughs> oh, thank, thank you, you. All right, that's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something.